Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are going to give this just a few minutes before we get started today. Um, just wait for the, um, the count to go up. Uh, my name is Megna. I am the event manager over at Book Larder here in Fremont, the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle, and we're so excited to have you all here today. Um, like I said, we're going to get started in just a few minutes. Um, but in the meantime, please try, please uh, feel free to use the chat function to let us know where you are listening from today. And if you're enjoying a snack or a drink, um, if you select the all panelists and attendees option within the chat, then everyone will be able to see your message. I was drinking a LaCroix. I seem to have misplaced it, but. Welcome everyone. All right. Um, well, like I said, my name is Megna. I'm the event manager over at Book Larder in Seattle. Um, and hello from Dallas with a glass of iced tea. Hi, Mia. Um, one of the happy surprises, I think, of um, doing virtual events is obviously that we've been able to reach um, audience, audience uh, members and um, customers from all over the world and all over the country. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, hello to Susan. Hi, Susan is uh, drinking a white wine and chowing on dill popcorn in Boston. That sounds delicious. Okay, well, today we are here to um, chat about the Flowercraft, the, the Flowercraft Bakery and Cafe cookbook, uh, written by Heather Hardcastle. Um, Heather has very graciously um, sent us book plates, so if you'd like a signed copy of the book, those are available on our website, booklarder.com. Um, I will paste a link into the chat later for anyone interested in giving that a look through. Um, but we're here with Heather. Um, Heather is the owner of Flowercraft Bakery in Marin County, California. Um, she opened the first Flowercraft Bakery in 2013. And um, today guests line up daily for her signature cinnamon rolls, breads, cookies, specialty cakes, and more that are sold at the cafe, um, all gluten-free, which is uh, really exciting. Uh, we were just speaking about how um, lovely it's been to sort of have those small uh, moments of, um, you know, enjoying something tasty from our local bakeries. And um, during this, these last um, couple months, this, these last uh, two years, I guess you could say. So um, looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, Heather will be joined in conversation by Aran Goyaga, who is a award-winning author, photographer, and professionally tra trained pastry chef. Um, she's a three-time James Beard Award finalist, and um, she's also the author of Canal Vanille, which is a wonderful gluten-free cookbook um, that we also have at the store, and I'll paste a link in the chat for that as well. Um, so today's event, we are going to have about 30 to 45 minutes for conversation. Uh, Heather and Aran are going to chat a little bit about the book, and then we will um, take questions at the end. If you submit your questions in the chat function at the bottom of your screen, Aran will be able to pick those up and, um, and ask those questions to Heather as we near the end of the event. Um, and we will do our best to get to as many questions of yours as we can. Without further ado, Thank you. And this, and this photo that I love so much. Oh, thank you. Well, I had an amazing team of, uh, an amazing creative team, which helped me put all that together and really bring the recipes to life. So it's very lucky. It's really beautiful. Thank uh, you. How has it been to operate a cafe, bakery during the pandemic? Do you have labor shortages like we uh, do here? We, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> It, it has been challenging in every way, really in every way. Um, it's really forced me to think about my business differently. Um, I think that the team that we do have has just gotten tighter and tighter in every way because we've been through so much together this past year. Um, mm -hmm. And we really 
prioritize trying to keep as many of our longtime staff employed as possible. So we just got creative with like everyone. I mean, this is not unique to us, you know, with um, what we offered and how we did business last year. So how many employees do you have right now? Um, at this point, we probably have about 20, which is okay, kind of, yeah, which is kind of a big team for us. Yeah, I mean, still tiny by anybody's standards, but it's it feels like it feels like a big family. Yeah, yeah, I'd say it's pretty it's pretty big for a bakery. You only have one location. We have two right? locations. Two, two locations. locations. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, tell us a little bit about how first of all you how your journey into gluten free baking. Yes. And then you started a granola business. Yes. And then you opened a bakery. Yes, like all good things in life, right? I mean, the road is never quite straight, right? It never it never goes where you think it will in the beginning. But um, yes, so we opened our first location in 2013. Um, I got into baking primarily because in about 2000, I was um, found that I was gluten intolerant and which was such a blessing actually to find that because I had really been plagued by just pain and digestive issues for most of my life and to sort of come across, kind of stumble across that, that nugget really changed everything for me. And um, in those days, there was nothing really in 2000. I mean, gluten-free wasn't a thing. So there was very, very few options, certainly no freshly baked options. There were some packaged options, which weren't very good. Um, so I went, I sort of did this deep dive into cooking and baking and got super into it. Um, and so I made a career change in about 2008 and I went to pastry school and um, just to develop technique and some fundamentals. And at that point I was in my early thirties. Um, so I knew that the, the late night restaurant life wasn't for me. And um, I had had a business for 15 years before that. So I always knew that I would sort of take what I learned and adapt it to my gluten-free life and do something on my own. And flower craft came from that. So, but you had, it was granola, you had one product first. Right? We had one product first, yes. So we started with our granola, which we still make in package today. It's sold all over the place. And um, uh, we started doing a local farmer's market just once a week. And we built this kind of cult following for the granola. We just had two flavors. Mm -hmm. We still only have two flavors. Um, and from there, I kind of expanded out. I mean, we were renting a commercial kitchen, like during graveyard shifts, my husband and I making this granola product and selling it. And um, I, you know, I used my wonderful, loyal customers as testers. And I kind of started introducing pastry products um, one at a time and things just grew from there. Yeah. And so, I mean, but you opened in 2013. 2013 but you started our first store. Yeah. First store. So, yeah. I mean, I, 2013, by then I feel like things were a little bit more. I agree. Um, yeah. it, it was a little bit more known yeah. or people were already sort of going into it knowing, oh, I feel, I don't, you know, something to look for if you weren't feeling well or it was part of people's right. conversation when it came to health. But before that, Absolutely. I remember I was a pastry chef in 2004. And I had a friend who was already living gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free. She had all these yeah. things that were really bizarre to me. And I was working at the Ritz-Carlton as a pastry chef. And I remember she was telling me, you should, you should take that and apply. By then, at the time, I wasn't gluten-free. Mm -hmm. she, was, she would tell me, you should take that knowledge and develop products for us because it's the future and I you know I never said this to her but I right. thought in my head I thought oh that's for hippies or that's like <laughs> something totally not in you know in my path and right. uh, because it seemed this is 2004 it seemed so unusual or, or not really something and that you said, I, when was that you 2004 know, you said 2004. Yeah, yeah, I really think between like 2000 and 2010, I think a lot of awareness. I think there's there was a huge shift in awareness for gluten free. Yeah, I mean, when and we that, opened in 2013, I feel like people knew what it was, but there's it still wasn't. People still didn't associate it necessarily with quality. Like people thought, oh, well, I don't, I don't have mm -hmm. to eat that, so like, why would I want to? Yeah. So, so I, 
Yeah. So I've always made it my mission to really like change the way people think about gluten-free. Yes, we're gluten-free, but the fact that it's gluten-free is a great bonus. I just really want the food to stand on its own. I just want it to be good regardless of, yeah. yeah. So what is your bestseller now? Oh goodness. Um, I think it changes seasonally. Um, although I will say that our scones are um, mm. perpetual bestsellers. Um, people love blueberries. So anytime, so the blueberry lemon scone, um, as you know, from working in pastry. It's interesting. Yeah, I always find it fascinating what people want because I never, I, I feel like I don't, I have no pulse in what other people <laughs> want. I'm trying to find the sourdough uh, recipe in the book um, because that's always, I'm always drawn to breads because they are, after all, the most difficult thing to, that really rely on gluten to be, as we know it, to be Absolutely. successful or, or kind of mimic, not, and I hate the word mimic, I shouldn't say that, but to emulate us emulate yes. or, or yeah. make us feel that sense of nostalgia i can't wait right. to find it but there's it's a, in the back, a recipe it's near the back of the book yeah in one of the back oh, here chapters, it is. but yeah in the master master here recipes chapter yeah um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that looks but so anytime you take away good. sugar and fat um it becomes more challenging certainly mm -hmm. working without gluten so um yeah yeah i will say that that sourdough bread recipe brioche. yeah that's brioche <laughs> yeah yum that looks so good. That makes awesome French toast. I mean, and other things, grilled cheese, um, all it that. It looks amazing. Thank you. Country. The country white country sandwich Country white bread. sandwich bread. And I would say that recipe is a really great, that and the focaccia, which are um, also in that chapter, um, mm -hmm. really great, like first bread recipes for people who are interested in experimenting with gluten-free at home. Um, they're universally pleasing. You can use them in a million different ways. You can go sweet or savory, great for sandwiches. Those, those two are really like, should be staples in any gluten-free baker's repertoire. What you, speaking of staples, yeah. um, what are your favorite, I mean, I can, and that's the thing sometimes when someone starts in their gluten-free baking journey, there seems to be so many different flours because I think right. people forget that wheat is about 70% uh, starch and 30% whole right. grain. So then you're right. trying to really like fit that kind of exactly. equation, uh, yeah. in, in a recipe. And so you have to have kind of a combination of things. So what are your, like, if you can only have, let's say three things, three ingredients, flour ingredients, what would those be? Oh and are you a fan of the all-purpose mixes? Oh my goodness, so much to unpack in that question. And I want to know what your three favorite flowers are too. But um, I would say if I had to pick, um, if I had to pick three, I would say white rice, sorghum, and probably a starch, probably tapioca. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, or almond. I mean, it's kind of a toss up there. But I think in terms of creating like a well-rounded pantry, say for a home cook, um, I would go for a starch like tapioca and then a couple of whole grain flour, you know, the whole grain sorghum and then a starchier rice flour, like a white rice. I think mm -hmm. those, if you have those three staples in your pantry, you can make a lot of things. Yeah. Do you have preference in brands that you, what do you use in the bakery? In the bakery, we use, yeah, in the bakery, we use a, um, a brand actually from Pacific Northwest called Western Foods, but um, but I would say that the most, um, the most uh, approachable and the one that you can find pretty much everywhere, Bob's Red Mill makes an awesome product um, and they have a huge assortment of flowers. Mm -hmm. They're really good quality. They have um, a dedicated gluten-free mill. So you can't go wrong there. Yeah. 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 There's a company in California that I really like called Authentic Foods. Uh -huh. Do you ever use their, do you ever work with their stuff? It's so finely milled. It's just like, it makes everything, it's, there's no hardly that texture of uh, graininess or grittiness. It just really hydrates super well. I love that. Um, yeah. I've heard of them, but I am, I have not used them. So I'm going to seek that out. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. And then I want to, um, your question about all purpose blends. Um, no, I would, I would say. 
Um, no, I am not a fan of them. Mm -hmm. I really feel that I, I understand the needs. I really do. Um, I would say that if somebody really doesn't want to have three or four flowers in their pantry, I completely understand that. Um, although when you really start getting into the art of gluten-free baking, I mean, that's really, you know, balancing your starches and your whole grains. That's really where you can get that definition and texture. Um, I'm a believer that your scone should not taste like your cookie. Your bread should not taste like your pound cake. Um, so this whole idea of all purpose, I think is a little misleading. Um, I would say if you do buy an all purpose mix or you make your own all purpose mix, um, cookies and brownies, those types of things, quick breads, that probably you'll, you'll have the most success using that kind of blend with those items. Yeah. Yeah. The things that are not as earth, like things that you don't want them to be as earthy or, right. you know, uh, right. just kind of. Right. Where you're using um, some fats and some sugars and you're, you kind of just want that sort of soft, sweet, spongy kind of texture. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, do you do any other allergens? Are you just, do you have people that say, oh, well, can you also make vegan yeah. pastries? You know, if there's such a whole, I feel like with gluten-free is sort of like the gateway into this whole right. uh, world of also not eating dairy or, you know, kind of re avoiding refined sugars and right. sort of more like a health, overall health uh, functional. Yeah. I will say definitely that our customers are people who love food and people who are health conscious. Um, and I think people that are attracted to the book would pick it up for the same reasons. Um, I try to provide options um, in the recipes in the book as well as in the stores um, for people of all kinds of different um, dietary needs. I would say the most common questions I get are what's dairy free and what's vegan. I've, I've seen in the mm -hmm. last like, year really that the uptick in people who are eating plant-based foods um is dramatically increased so mm -hmm. a couple of years ago everybody was paleo mm -hmm. and i've seen that interesting kind of, it's interesting yeah. yeah um so i've seen that kind of wane and then kind of keto came in a little bit and that's kind of waned and now it's really i mean there are keto is kind of still a thing and then um but vegan is really that's, mm -hmm. that's yeah yeah, so, which is another whole beast when you're dealing vegan. Right. I feel like be, vegan baking when you are able to introduce wheat or gluten. Yes, it's sort of like pretty doable. But then when you start it, it, taking away the binding element, yes, and you don't have eggs, then that's when right. it becomes I mean, like dairy the whole issue. Is, dairy free is pretty easy. Easy, um, yeah, but. Uh, egg free is much harder. And especially yeah. when you get into the breads, um, mm -hmm. it's much harder. Yeah. yeah. So in the book, I mean, I have several vegan recipes. I have the uh, vegan tahini. Let me grab my book too. Um, I have the uh, vegan tahini and halva brownies, um, which is. That sounds amazing. Dish. Yeah. So that's this one, the vegan tahini mm. brownies. And these have like, um, if you don't know what halva is, um, mm -hmm. You can find it actually in most well-stocked grocery stores in the candy section. Um, and they're like in these little bars. Um, we have a, we're lucky enough here to have a really great uh, Middle Eastern market. So I can buy it like by the tub, but it's this, it's a sesame candy that's flossy. I think that's probably mm -hmm. the best description of it, sweet and flossy. Mm -hmm. um, and when it's kind of melted into a brownie, you get these chunky bits of sweet sesame. It's delicious. Mm, so good. Yeah, so this vegan yeah. tahini and halva brownies. Um, I also have um, the sourdough bread that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, that is a vegan recipe as well. Um, and the crumble I just saw. Yeah, the bars, exactly. the crumble yeah, bars. The fruit bars, the vegan donuts, these guys. Um, yeah, they're a baked donut, so cake type donut. And um, a million different variations. Every week in the shops, we do a different kind of donut. So. This week we're doing lemon blueberry. Last week was, oh boy, I don't, maybe vanilla chocolate chip. So, I mean, anything you can think of putting in the donut, you can make a donut. Um, and then there's also one of my very favorite recipes in the book and favorite things to eat period are the um, vegan oatmeal cookies. Mm. And those are made with ground pecans and gluten-free oats. That's in the cookie chapter. Oh, here we are. Yeah, a lot of vegan 
A lot of vegan options. Yeah, so lots of vegan options. Delicious. Yeah, and this is a good one too for people who are uh, avoiding refined sugar because this one is made with um, maple syrup. And of course the, um, this one is actually has raisins. So this is a great one for people avoiding refined sugar. Um, I'm a fan of chocolate chips. So I would put, if I was making these <laughs> chocolate chips instead of raisins. So, you know, we did you work ones that are fruit sweetened. Yes. Did you work on the book during quarantine? I did. Was that that time? Well, yeah. it's kind of like a nice, it was, how did you manage both things to do a book well, and a bakery? Yeah. Well, <laughs> so well uh, right. Um, I mean, I think that as you well know, writing a book just takes a lot of discipline. Um, I mean, it's kind of a solo process, you know? So mm -hmm. during quarantine, having that big body of work that I could really focus on, mm -hmm. it was kind of a godsend, you know, because it just kind mm -hmm. of, it sort of stopped the tape loop of well, what's happening, you know, just of the unknown. It was like, it just was, I have to do this. I have to write this chapter this week and, you know, focus and get it done. So um, you just break it down and, and that's how I do it. I don't know how you yeah. do it. But I don't, but I don't have a bakery. Right. <laughs> which is totally different. Yes, but you also do all the styling and the photos, which is like, wow that is that's amazing yeah. did you shut down did you have to shut down the bakery for a while during um, in the initial lockdown yeah so the first couple of months we had the two locations so our store in um san anselmo which was our first store um also in run county um we shut that down for probably eight weeks um it was interesting in that in those as we all know those first two months of quarantine mm -hmm. grocery was like crazy through the roof you couldn't get anything so our granola business funny enough there was a huge demand for that product mm -hmm. so we shut down our San Anselmo retail operations um, basically turned that into a granola factory seven days five days a week and then the remainder of the time um, we did charitable meals out of that kitchen because there was also such a need for you know um, we focused on seniors um, people that really for health reasons couldn't get out um, to, to purchase their food and maybe weren't as savvy using apps and Instacarts and those types of things. Mm -hmm. So um, we did a lot of charitable meals out of that kitchen too the first few months. That's amazing. I, it's almost like I've forgotten that, no. you know, that when we went to lockdown at first, you couldn't find yeast. How was that? For you? <laughs> you couldn't find yeast or, or I remember it's, it just all seems like a fog, but I, right. I actually remember book larder. I was doing some breads and stuff. Book mm -hmm. was cooking also for the mm -hmm. hospital and yeah. I was making some breads. I mean, I have a small kitchen so I couldn't right. do large sure. production, but I remember they gave me some yeast because you couldn't find it anywhere. Right. And just yeah, how I mean, that whole craziness. Right, well, that was interesting because uh, we found in the early part of the pandemic um, that the access, uh, the wholesale access to ingredients, there was, that was very different. So we had really good access to all of the ingredients that we needed mm -hmm. where you couldn't find it was in retail. Mm -hmm. So interesting. yeah, so we were doing meal kits for people um, that included a lot of raw ingredients. We were also doing produce boxes for people. So we were doing um, from our produce supplier, they were providing these produce assortments every week. And then we put together a series of recipes every week so that people could use everything in their box. So they would come to us and pick up their produce and, you know, take it home with the recipes. And so that was, that was fun too. Um, just one of the many ways we pivoted, but yeah. um, it was definitely a hustle. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you've converted many people to gluten-free. I hope lifestyles. so. I hope so. Um, I hope that people see it now as like not something that's mysterious. It's something mm -hmm. that's approachable and just like healthy eating, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Although there's, I feel like there is, it's like everything when it take when it gets branded right? and, and then, you know, like uh, to supermarket, like a uh, packaged foods that are gluten-free. And so they're not of really course. any healthier. They're not but any when, healthier. When you go to a bakery where you know, you know, that everything's made from right locally sourced or, or you know like absolutely high quality sourced ingredients yep. you are clearly and you can see it in this book very conscious of the ingredients that you're using all For of sure. that it's like a totally different 
Absolutely. Um, and I mean, I concept. think, yeah, I mean, I think that that is the, you know, that is the case for home cooking is that when you know mm -hmm. what's going in your food, I mean, even if you're choosing to make yourself a chocolate cake, like, and we should all be making ourselves chocolate cake, yeah. chocolate cake is, you know, good for, good for life. Um, but you know, when you're choosing to make that for yourself, like, you know, what's, you know, what's in it, you have control over the quality. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can open a bakery here in Seattle. <laughs> you wouldn't be the first person to ask me that. Um, so, you know, I that would be fun. Yeah, we actually, I mean, we have a couple, but not yeah. for a city that's very uh, health conscious. We mm -hmm. don't really have a lot of uh, options as far as bakeries. Interesting. So Interesting. Yeah. I think Seattle will be such a bakery town too, just because it's like the weather is so... Yeah, many bakeries, but... Right, but no only a couple gluten free. Yeah, dedicated. Yeah. So, uh, what's what do you think no. is the future for gluten free baking, or I guess in general, for some, as we are moving away from sort of the traditional mm -hmm. butter, sugar, eggs. Right, and you touched upon that, but I do think that plant based baking. I agree. Um, more gluten-free grains that are not necessarily, and there's some wheat that is treated in this country, uh, very heirloom-like and mm -hmm. small batches, but most yep. of the wheat is just a commodity yep. and totally treated with uh, round top and all these yeah. chemicals. Like say and all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So do you, is that kind of what you Yeah, I mean, I do think that the trend is toward um, plant-based, but I mean, I think like, I think of myself as a plant, I call it plant forward. So, um, you know, because I am not vegan and my bakery isn't vegan, but I definitely think that we prioritize. And in the book as well, um, basically every single recipe in this book is vegetarian. So mm -hmm. I choose to call it plant forward as opposed to vegetarian. Um, but that's, you know, that's what I mean. Just things that um, prioritize seasonal, uh, healthy ingredients. Um, and certainly you can add protein sustainably sourced protein. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel that the trend in food and what I mm -hmm. wanted to communicate in the book is that these all have integrity on their own without having to rely on protein as the center of any kind of um, mm -hmm. yeah. or product. Because you do have, be besides cookies and cakes, there's a, there's a whole chapter of sort of brunch uh yes do you offer do you have brunch, brunch. At, the, at the cafe every day or is it like we a do weekend? yeah we're um we're breakfast and lunch so and I just I'm a fan of brunch I love the idea of brunch just as a meal that you would do on a out of your regular routine that you would be sharing um with people it just seems special to me so I love that mm -hmm. I love that idea of brunch yeah. Yes, the chapter on brunch there, as it's called. And there's a really wonderful like a bunch of, recipe in there. Yeah, yeah the frittata. Oh, yeah, so good. And this the one's Bostock. a good one. The strata. I'm familiar with Bostock. Yes. Do people? Yes. I, I love think Bostock. Americans need to know more about Bostock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't know what it is, it's usually. Um, toasted brioche that's spread with some sort of almond cream or frangipan and then mm -hmm. some type of fruit. It's delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Salmon. Yes. Little that's toast. Sweet. Yeah, a little tartine. And then the quiche yeah. recipe, this is a staple too. Um, and in the back of the book, there's a chapter on master recipes and there's both a sweet and a savory um, tart dough in there. And that's this, the savory one is what I would suggest for the quiche. I am looking through the Q and A. Let me see. Love Bostock too, Gabriel. Yes, I <laughs> that just came through. <laughs> when baking gluten free from scratch, do you find that the flours are more expensive than wheat based flours? Do you think prices will come down if the market expands? More people eat gluten free. Um, I do find it again. It depends on what kind of flour you're buying. Like I think that the three that I suggested, the tapioca. Um, Certainly, if you're buying tapioca in a fancy natural foods market, it's going to be less, it's going to be more expensive. I find tapioca um, in my Asian market 
and it is literally a 25% the same thing. So, um, yeah. Somebody was telling me there's a tapioca shortage. There is yeah, a tapioca yeah. shortage. I've been having a heck of a time getting it for the bakery and it's a staple for us. And I'm like, yeah. whenever one of my suppliers says that they have it, I'm like, I'll take 25 bucks. Yeah. Set them aside for me. So <laughs> I've also been using arrowroot as sort of, yes. I know they're not the same, but, the, but I kind of use them. You can them use cornstarch too, although... Yeah. I try to stay away from cornstarch yeah. for various reasons, yeah. but that certainly is an option. Yeah. Um, but to answer the question directly, um, it depends what kind of flour you're buying. If you're buying almond flour versus all-purpose flour, 100% it's going to be more expensive. But again, the sorghums, the white rice, and the tapiocas, those are pretty moderate in terms mm -hmm. of price. Um, and it, again, if you're buying a um, conventional all-purpose flour, it's going to be less than like a good heirloom flour as well. Interesting question. Please yeah. do talk about your sourdoughs. I have both of your books and they're similar, but process is very different. Like, can I use the canela vanille starter with a flower craft sourdough recipe? Interesting. Liz Ridinger, is that you? I saw that question come through. Um, hi, Liz. How are you? Um, well, I don't know, Aran. Yeah. What do you think? Can we use your starter with uh, I, I you haven't, use your starter I haven't, with my recipe? I have not looked at your, uh, I have not made it. I looked at it. Uh, what is the hydration ratio of your starter? Um, it is one to one. So mine is a little bit more hydrated. Uh -huh. So I think it would work. Maybe there's like a slightly different, you know, sometimes it might seem a little bit, if you use my starter, which is a little bit more water in it than mm -hmm. yours, uh, for your it's recipe, it might, it might need to, you might need to hold back on the water right. a little bit and then add more. Um, but I, I find that I've made recipes from other cookbooks with my starter and you just have to you can just kind of adapt it. Yeah. 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 You kind of, I, what I find, uh, best with any bread recipe that's gluten-free is always to hold off on the water a little bit because it's easier to add more water than, and you can mix it as long as you want, because it's clearly not going to be overworked. Right. And There's then no such thing as over mixing with gluten-free. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so then adding instead of having to add more flour later and totally messes up the flour to yeast and right. water ratio so i think so well i'll have to try it I'll have what to, uh, what um flour do you use for your starter uh, brown rice brown rice interesting i use yeah. teff yeah. yeah i use teff in a lot of bread recipes uh -huh. but but i feel like it's probably quite similar i agree most yeah. of the brown rice might be slightly sweeter and teff a little bit more sour but I think yeah 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 also if you can't you find should try teff, it and report yeah, back <laughs> yeah please please report back um also if you can't find teff I feel like sorghum is a, sorghum makes a really good starter too and buckwheat which I feel yeah. like buckwheat is really good because a lot of people ask me about grain-free right sourdough so I always mm -hmm. say buckwheat and I like not to go have to the like sourdough buckwheat. tangent yeah <laughs> not to go into the sourdough tangent but I find that um this is just my own personal experience. When I use uh, Bob's buckwheat and mm -hmm. Arrowhead and Mills buckwheat, which are a little bit darker, and I actually uh, emailed Bob's about this, about why their buckwheat flour is so dark, because I mail my own groats, and so it's a lot lighter. Mm -hmm. and they just told me that they put some more hole in there, like at the end, just to make it like earthier and, yeah. and, and more flavorful, I guess. Um, but I find that that is harder to ferment than when I grind my own Interesting. growth. So it's all, I feel like the variance between brands right. and, the, and the- Oh, for sure. Yeah. There's a huge variance between brands. Yeah. And what do you yeah. think about, because what I find in Europe and um, from in, being in France is that the buckwheat flour there is entirely different than the buckwheat flour yeah. here. Because the buckwheat flour in Europe is usually from ground up growths. So right. it's not as dark as the stuff that you find right. here because it doesn't have any added kind of more of the hull or the, right. the, the mm -hmm. exterior part mm -hmm. of it. And mm -hmm. I feel like it's those two, um, uh, Bob's Red Mill and Arrowhead and Mills that have similar buckwheat flowers. But then there's another brand called Anthony's Goods that I I think that they don't mill. They're, they're not a mill, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. But they're also from California and they their flower is lighter. It's more European, which I prefer. Yeah, just I prefer, because I, I prefer that too. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, 
sometimes I do like my big woods to be dark, but not always. Right. And, and sometimes they're too like earthy and sour. The buckwheat is quite earthy. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I agree. I, I prefer that kind of mild flavor too, which is hard to find here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So Anthony's goods is really good or you grind your own goods. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, Oh, this one, I actually was uh, also thinking this question when you were saying about culinary school. When you studied pastry at the CIA, were you able to taste anything? Um, I tasted everything and I suffered. Mm. Uh, but I just told myself that I was going to do it. I mean, I had lived at that point um, 25 plus years eating gluten and being uncomfortable. But, um, for, you know, fortunately, I didn't have extreme health conditions from it. It was just it really made my stomach hurt all the time. And I had really bad eczema, you know? So, um, yeah, so, but I just, I did taste everything and I suffered. Um, but uh, just so that I could make sure that I knew what I was doing and knew what I was trying to replicate, it was necessary that I did taste it. Yeah, yeah, you kind of have to know. You do, you need right. to know what you're going for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Another question about uh, having a hard time eating rice flour, which mm -hmm. seems to be, rice seems to be also one that a lot of people can't do. Yep. And what is the best substitute for rice flour? Interesting. Well, I mean, I would say, I would say brown rice and sorghum are somewhat interchangeable. So yeah, because they're both sweet. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, um, I mean, I always tell people buckwheat. I know they're not quite the same. I yeah. know that they're not, but. I feel like you can, you will have a different profile, but I feel like they have a similar way that they, they both get kind of slime, start like slimy. Like if yeah. you soak buckwheat groats, they're kind of slimy, just like oats. So I think that that also is like a binding, it's sort of like a glutinous, it's not gluten, but like a glutinous aspect yeah. to them that I like. So even though they're- I agree with that. One is sweet and one is earthy, but like how affects the how texture. they how they behave. I agree. I think exactly. the flavor is very different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what do you think about um, about oats? Because oat flour is yeah. is a thing these days. And I actually don't bake very much with oat flour. Mm -hmm. um, I use it in the in the vegan oatmeal cookies, which is in this book. But um, I don't bake a lot with it. Yeah, I I do. Mm -hmm. um, but I always tell people to use buckwheat. I, buckwheat yeah. is my my so that's your go to. Everything. Interesting. Yeah. But I, we all have our go tos. They're, yeah, they're opposite. One is sweet and one is earthy. But yeah, the way again because of that sliminess and when right. I that's a terrible word, but that sort of gel, gelling gelatinous yeah. consistency, the gelling quality. It, yeah, it works in recipes in a similar way. I find mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so like my sourdough bread recipe uses part of it is oat flour. Um, I've, uh, but I also think that if you take a recipe and look at the whole grain to starch ratio, you can kind of play around I, yeah. in those parameters I, and maintain some, that aspect of whole grain and, and starch and just use whatever you want and then absolutely. play around with it. Yeah, we're talking about tapioca and cornstarch or arrowroot being somewhat interchangeable. I mean, in my kitchen, if my supplier tells me I'm out of brown rice, I say substitute sorghum. Yeah, and, and I might adjust a little bit with um, maybe adding a little bit of millet flour or something just mm -hmm. to sort of balance millet. Um, like I think millet has a really lovely color, mm -hmm. so I think that that makes sometimes gluten-free baked goods, especially brown rice, can be kind of off gray, which mm -hmm. I think is less than appealing. You know, so that beautiful golden color of millet or mm -hmm. corn flour or something like that really kind of helps to bring it to life in a very pleasing way to yeah. the eye. Yeah, that's true. The colors are, are different. I mm -hmm. actually use, so a lot of my, the, I don't, I mean, I do use something but very little just mm -hmm. because of digestive reasons for me. Yeah. And so I use a lot of psyllium, which uh -huh. does affect kind of the crumb color. Right. People say, oh, this looks like it's kind of pink or purple. Yeah, yeah it's from the psyllium. The psyllium. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, and I do use anthen. I mean, I try to keep it because I can taste it. Like I can taste it in other baked goods if there's a lot of it in there. So um, I do use it, but you know, very minimally. And then certainly I I also use things like flax, soaked flax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. There's ways. Um, let's see. Is there a pastry bread baked good that you feel is most difficult to recreate gluten-free or have not been able to form formulate a good recipe for? Yes. 
<laughs> so many. <laughs> so, the one, the one that uh, is eluding me, and um, Aron, if you ever wanted to like collaborate on this one, I'm all in. Um, but the one that's really been eluding me, the croissant. Yeah, I was gonna say that. <laughs> yeah, of course, right. I, I, um, yeah, I, I've been experimenting, but it's just like the same thing. Like if it's not gonna be good on its own, I agree. Then I would never share a recipe. Same. You know? Yeah. People say, well, what about croissant? And yeah. I mean, we we did we do have a good puff pastry recipe. Um, it's mm -hmm. extremely labor intensive to make. So um I'm pretty confident about that. But the the croissant is it has eluded mm -hmm. me. Yeah. And yeah. I just again, it's like I'm not gonna offer it to offer it. I'm not going to offer a small, hard croissant, which I've tasted in so many gluten-free bakeries, I'm like, mm -mm, no, this is not. So, but yeah. anyway, um, yeah, I'm not going to do it just to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hard one because you're, you need the elasticity of gluten-free. You need the elasticity. Yep. For fermentation and lamination. So it's like, and I've had, double lemon. I've had a couple of good ones and I'm just like, yeah. wow. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. All right. One more, um, just wondering if there is information included on in carb content for a diabetic diet. I'm trying to get my elderly dad to take better care of his blood sugar. Whole grains are good. Whole grains are good. Yes, I agree with that. Um, I, I don't have specific information in the book about carb content mm -hmm. for all of the flours, um, but I would say stick to the more whole grain ones. Um, yeah. You know, make substitutions where you need to. I mean, I hope that just, you know, our conversation might have... Um, giving you some ideas about how you might go about doing that or altering the recipes in a little, in, in a way to do that a little bit. Yeah. Have you experimented with sugar-free at all? <laughs> There's also someone that says they are gluten-free, but they want butter and eggs in their baked goods, which of course, <laughs> but um, sugar-free- I want butter and eggs in my baked goods too, <laughs> yes. Uh, sugar-free seems to be also a question that I get a lot. Right. And diabetics and- Right. Um, it's a whole nother, it's a whole other, yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, I mean, I do use uh, maple syrup, as I said, in those vegan oatmeal cookies. That's a great one. Um, and I will say that the easiest kind of sugar to substitute, um, because certainly going from like a granulated sugar or a white sugar to a liquid sugar is a, they're not a one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah. Um, so you could certainly do something like coconut sugar. Um, I don't use coconut sugar a lot because I think it makes everything taste like coconut. And I happen to like coconut, but I do feel okay. like it's a very, um, it's it can be definitely the leading flavor with whatever you put it with, mm -hmm. but that's an easy substitute. I don't, um, I don't use xylitol or mm -hmm. stevia mm -hmm. in my, mm -hmm. in my baking. Um, this is what happened to me recently. I am um, probably not important, but I, wanted to experiment with monk fruit uh -huh. a little bit. And then I started buying this brand of monk, granulated monk fruit uh, sweetener yep. to realize that I started having like really hard time digesting foods and I, to realize that it was actually alcohol sugar. It wasn't really right. monk fruit itself. It was just a monk fruit extract with a little bit of like alcohol sugar. And so, so it was horrible, super expensive. And I thought, it is very oh, expensive, is yeah. and that's the other thing too, you know, and as a, um, like in terms of creating recipes for the book and also for the stores, I really want it to feel approachable. Um, again, something, my idea with cooking in general is that I want everything to feel really inclusive mm -hmm. um, and not be this very exclusive kind of thing where if you're not gluten-free, you don't want to eat it. If you, you know, can't afford to buy the $10 two ounce bag of swerve or whatever um sugar substitute is you don't yeah. eat it um so yeah i try to be aware of that too and just make things yeah. that are really yeah easy to find approachable yeah and and, and like ellen marie says you know she's gluten-free and she wants butter and eggs and her baked goods so it's, mm -hmm. it's always like a balance between right you know that uh kind of traditional baking of the expectation and then more a wholesome right take on it and I, I, I don't even like to say adaptation because I don't think that's what you're doing here anyway um of, of taking something and trying to mimic it at all um, right because like this sourdough pizza with pesto potatoes manchego looks just so good 
Thank you. Yeah, and that's that. great too. I mean, if you're going to go to the trouble to feed and maintain a sourdough starter, you should have um, yeah. many things to do with it other than just make yeah. a loaf of bread once a week. So yeah, totally. um, there's a waffle recipe in the book, the sourdough waffles, which certainly could also be pancakes. You don't need to do a single thing different other than cook it on a griddle instead of a waffle <laughs> iron. But yeah, the sourdough pizza with manchego, that's a good one. Um, yeah, certainly the bread. In the stores, we do sourdough bagels, sourdough cookies. Yep, that's amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Any more questions? I feel like we answered all questions. Great. Did everybody get the, the answers they were looking for? I, I mean, I'm learning from you, Aran. So. <laughs> Next time we'll do a, a live baking. We'll bake. Oh, that would be book. so fun. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do a, a croissant soon. Oh, oh yeah. my goodness. That could be an all day situation. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, this was great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. It was such a pleasure to talk yeah. to you. Thank you so Congratulations. Much. I love it. Thank book. you. It's so beautiful. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your book. Thank you. Hi, Heather. Hi, Ron. Hi. It was so nice to hear the both of you chat. Um, I feel like I learned uh, so much more than I even thought I needed to know about uh, gluten-free flour. So thank you for excited and sharing all your um, all your knowledge. Um, it was such a pleasure to meet you both, uh, and thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, this author talk will actually be available on our YouTube channel within 48 hours. So if you would like to watch back and take notes on any uh, different, you know, flower combinations, uh, or if you know someone who would really love this chat, uh, who didn't get to attend tonight, that will be posted there and it will also be shared out in a post event email that will come through your Zoom. Um, also, Heather has very uh, graciously, as I mentioned before, uh, sent on signed book plates. So we do have signed books at Book Larder. Um, you can support this author tech by purchasing the book at booklarder.com or any other independent bookstore that you love. Um, on behalf of Book Larder, thank you so much, Heather and Aran. I'll see you on the flip side and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone. Good night, thank everyone. Bye-bye.